but good morning and welcome um, in this uh, shock workshop putting data protection into practice the general data protection regulation and the dia elda consent form wizard i will share my screen for a little introduction can you see my screen yeah thank you for uh, <laughs> letting me know um and yeah, it's clear it is. So I'm Laure Barbeau working at uh, DIA EU, uh, one of the partners of the SHOCK project. And uh, before giving the floor to the speakers for this morning, I will make a, a quick introduction. It will be quick, I promise. Uh, so first of all, a few rules and indications uh, to let us all enjoy this workshop, but I'm pretty sure you are already aware and very familiar with this kind of rules because our Life is now full of this uh, Zoom and uh, er or other kind of online meetings, but here it is. So the first part of this uh, workshop is recorded. Uh, you gave your consent uh, when registering and you will receive also a link to the recording uh, later. The slides will also be shared uh, probably on, on Zenodo and the link uh, will be sent to you as well. You can put all of your questions in the in the chat box. Uh, we will make sure that they will be answered either during the, the workshop or even after if uh, we, we don't have the time to tackle all the questions. Um, at some point in the workshop, we will use the breakout rooms uh, function of Zoom. So three rooms will be opened. You might have already chosen your subsession when uh, registering. So if it's the case, you have nothing to do. But if it did, you didn't choose, you can indicate your preference in the chat and we will organize the, the, the breakout rooms during the first part of the workshop. So in a few minutes, you will see again the three different groups and you will have the opportunity to say via the chat which session you would like to attend. And in the back end of this workshop, uh, Tanya and Christina that are here today to, uh, to help us will prepare the list of, uh, of participants. And I would also like to take the opportunity to thank uh, them, Tanya and, uh, and uh, Christina, for the great organization of the workshop. Uh, so Tanya Yankelevich is a training coordinator at LIBER and Christina Paodemaiti is assistant at the University of, of Ljubljana. So thank you uh, to both of you. Um, and the last uh, rule, but I can see that uh, you already know this one, uh, it's to turn off your mic uh, if you are not uh, speaking. Uh, so this workshop is organized uh, as one of the training events planned within the, the shock project. So if you never heard about it, uh, what is the shock project? Wait, I, yep, this one is better. Uh, it's a social sciences and humanities open cloud project that gather uh, 45 partners. Uh, it will last for 40 months, so it will last until April 2022 now. You can find all the resources, a uh, list of events, and also descriptions uh, of the project and the different um, work packages of the project on the SHOCK website, so sshopencloud.eu. And uh, within this, uh, this project, all the European research infrastructures like DIA, but also Clarin or CESDA or major European networks like LIBER, are working together to realize the SSH component of the EOSC, the European Open Science Cloud. And our goal is to enhance existing SSH resources, to make them uh, ready for EOSC, but also to develop uh, new tools or services, such as uh, the SSH Open Marketplace. It's a bit of auto-promotion here, uh, because DIA is uh, very well involved in, in this SSH Open Marketplace. Uh, but the goal of this project is also to support and organize a series of training events for SSH communities, uh, such, such as uh, this one today. And today, we have the chance to co-organize uh, this shock workshop with the DIA ELDA Working Group. Uh, so ELDA stands for Ethics and Legality in the Digital Arts and Humanities. Uh, it was founded in 2017 as a DIA working group and is co-chaired by our three speakers today. So if you want to know more about it, you are at the right place. Uh, ELDA is organizing uh, workshops, uh, creating training materials, uh, developing also tools such as the consent form wizard presented today. And you can find all the uh, possibility to get in touch or to have more information about the ELDA working group on, on this slide. 
And here are our three speakers of the day. Uh, so Vanessa Anschleger uh, is a digital humanities researcher at the Austrian Center for Digital Humanities and Cultural Heritage of the Austrian Academy of Science. Um, she is also co-chair of the Open Science Network Austria's working group on legal aspects and open science. And she is also a member of the Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee. Koralka kuznan Schlogar is head of the archive and researcher at the Institute of Ethnology and Folklore Research, a member of European Copyright Community, a national representative and the national coordinator for Croatia in, in DIA EU. And she's also primary contact for the researchers and institutions from Bosnia Herzegovina, Macedonia and Montenegro. And Walter Schlogler, Schlogler for, sorry, uh, is Institute Manager at the Center for Information Modeling, uh, Austrian Center for Digital Humanities at the University of Graz in Austria. He's a spokesman of the CLIA at a consortium and Austrian Deputy National Coordinator for Clarin, Eric and Daya EU. A co-opted uh, Board of Director member of uh, DHD, the Association for Digital Humanities uh, in German-speaking areas and is also part of the Clarin Legal and Ethical Issues Committee. And uh, here is the program for, for our morning. So we are together for uh, one hour and 30 minutes. Uh, just after my introduction, uh, Koralka will present a general view at importance of uh, data protection and ethics in research and the development of pertinent tools and services. Then Walter uh, will give you an introduction to GDPR principles and research exemptions. And finally, Vanessa will introduce prevalent personal data processing scenarios in research context and the consent wizard form. The consent formed wizard, in the other sense. Uh, after this, a bit before 11, so we will split into three groups in three different breakout rooms that I mentioned before. So again, if you have chosen your session during the registration, you have nothing to do. But for, so, for those of you who would like to change now or to pick up a session now, you can um, send a message via, via the chat and Christina and Tanya will organize the room accordingly. So we will have one session um, chaired by Koralka around gather data consent for communication and hosting an academic event and two sessions um, because you were uh, a lot uh, asking for this session. So we decided to make it uh, a two parallel session about the same topic, um, about gather data from and or about leaving people for research purposes. And after 30 minutes uh, in these breakout rooms, we will then come back in the main room, in this room for 10 minutes of uh, summary and wrap up of the sessions. So I think I said everything. I hope I didn't speak too much. <laughs> and I wish you a very nice me uh, morning uh, with our amazing uh, speakers. And I leave the floor and stop to share my screen and leave the floor to Koralka. We will start first. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I will share my screen. Is this okay? You can see it? Yes. So hello to all participants. We are glad to have you all here and thank you for your interest in our consent form bizar tool. Um, for a start, I would like to briefly introduce uh, our working group. Uh, I suppose a lot of you are familiar with Didaria and uh, we can say it's an infrastructure or a knowledge network in the field of digital humanities. And uh, DARIA promotes open access of methods, data, and tools along with uh, responsible conduct. And uh, in the frame of the consortium, the Working Group on Ethics and Legality in the Digital Arts and Humanities has been established with the aim uh, to address the needs of the research and education community regarding the topics of legal issues and research ethics. Uh, most of our members are just researchers uh, or cultural heritage experts, but fortunately, there are also a few legal experts among us. And uh, we are doing our best to produce some clear legal and ethical recommendations. Uh, we are offering some training and information material on intellectual property right, uh, rights and open license, uh, data protection and privacy, research ethics, and scholarly conduct. 
So um, we are focused on securing that um, uh, research data, material and results will be shared and distributed as open as possible. And of course, all that in accordance uh, with the EU regulation. And uh, we are offering uh, workshops to scholars in order to help them uh, with uh, these issues. Uh, ELDAH is currently a network of more than 40 people from 18 countries covering a large vari variety of uh, uh, disciplinary fields. And um, uh, we also work in close collaboration with other uh, working groups in DARIA, but also with similar groups among other European research uh, infrastructures uh, like the Legal and Ethical Issue Committee of CLARIN, uh, the CESDA, the Europeana Copyright Community, uh, Icarus Ethical Board, and also with some national working groups uh, like the Open Science Network Austria and more. Uh, at the end of this presentation, uh, you will get the links for our blog and web page, social network profiles, etc. So uh, you can find uh, more information about us, uh, our activities, and published uh, material there. Um, so um, let's get focused now on our today's topic and the explanation on why do we need a tool like Consent Form Wizard. Uh, since you are here with us today, I'm sure that you're quite aware of the importance of data protection and ethics in research. Uh, this is quite a complex issue, but I'll try to simplify it as much as possible, um, just to uh, give you some context for this uh, workshop. Uh, you must be aware that we are living in the era, era of open science movement. Uh, there is a political drive in Europe to facilitate free and public access to cultural heritage and also research data hosted at publicly funded institutions. Um, our working group and uh, DARIA in general also promote uh, open science and open access. And um, internet and um, technical development made it possible to publish and disseminate data throughout the world. Uh, everything seems so easy and uh, feasible, but uh, that comes in a package uh, with a lot of ethical dile dilemmas and legal obstacles. Um, you know, uh, not so long ago, as a researcher, we used to do some field work, uh, make interviews, uh, taking photos and storing personal data and uh, testimonies uh, with so much less worries. Um, uh, and possible complications on our minds. Um, we were following, of course, always uh, the code of ethics, but we were not so uh, burdened by legal regulations. Um, before this time of online publications and digital repositories, uh, there was uh, not so much risk of uh, data misuse. Uh, and also those data were not uh, available to a large number of people, actually. Um, so it was a different situation, different times. Uh, the free use of data um, was um, implying something else back then. And we are in totally different position with uh, this contemporary uh, open access uh, movement. Um, uh, when we talk about research, uh, especially in the social sciences and humanities, uh, private data are enormously um, uh, valuable uh, for the quality of research technologist uh, so I can see and discuss things from uh, this perspective and um, very often it is important to know how old is your informant uh, is it male or a female uh, what is his or her uh, uh, place of birth and so on and uh, before the internet uh, researchers didn't have a clue that collecting of those data uh, could become ethically and legally um, questionable in some context. Uh, the subjects of our research um, didn't mind us storing their testimonies in some archival storage, you know, behind the walls uh, and putting them uh, on a disposal eventually to some other researchers. Uh, but back then, uh, those human participants, or we as the researchers, uh, couldn't know that we will have repositories today. Uh, Today, of course, uh, we can't use and share those material as open uh, as we would, uh, would like to, uh, because um, we have their consent to be recorded, but for research purposes, uh, not to be published. So we would like to support open science movement and open access, put everything on the internet, uh, but sometimes we just don't have an appropriate consent. So today, in the age of this uh, digital information technology and the availability of information through the internet, uh, there are a lot of uh, new situations. Uh, we need to be aware of them. 
uh, in research projects involving human participants uh, as subjects, uh, privacy and uh, confidentiality uh, become key um, ethical questions. Uh, new directives, uh, recommendations and the laws have emerged uh, to regulate the rights of uh, those individuals. And um, um, why uh, data needs to be protected? Uh, simply said, uh, because of ethical and legal reasons. Uh, there are these directives, regulations and laws that require us to follow the rules. Uh, some of the ethical norms uh, found in the guidelines for research ethics can also be found in the legislation. For example, uh, the requirement of privacy and the consideration of human dignity. If researchers uh, don't follow the rules, uh, they may be subject to penalties and other sections. And that will happen because the researchers have broken the law, uh, not because they have acted in conflict with the guidelines uh, for research ethics. Um, Walter will talk about uh, Article 8 of the European Co uh, Convention on Human Rights, uh, about uh, GDPR and some other directives uh, that are taking care uh, that personal information will be uh, processed and used in a correct way. He will also explain uh, to you in more details also what uh, data needs uh, to be protected. I'll give you just a quick note that it's about the personal data, like names, addresses, emails. Uh, it includes pictures, the voice recordings, and also some sensitive personal data, like racial, racial uh, or um, ethnic origin, political opinions, and so on. Um, so today, when a research project uh, deals with those kind of data, uh, researchers are uh, obliged to inform the participants or subject of research and to obtain their consent. Um, it is the same uh, when you're organizing uh, some event and want to take a video or photos for further reports and publishing, or if you want to create a mailing list. Um, before it was all a matter of ethics in research, but today this is a legal request too. Um, so on the one side, this uh, development of a modern information and networks, uh, networked uh, society uh, brought to us a lot of improvements, new possibilities, but on the other side made our work far more complicated. Um, there are a number of uh, data protection issues that researchers encounter in their work. Uh, so uh, to make life easier uh, for scholars, digital humanities are developing different tools. Uh, so we are already having uh, on our disposal uh, the tools like uh, Clarins License Selector, for example. I suppose some of you have tried this one. And this brand new tool, uh, Consent Form Wizard. So more about the tool you will hear uh, later from Vanessa. And uh, now Walter will explain for a start the GDPR and the personal data issues in more details. So I hope you will enjoy this workshop. Uh, and this will be of use for you. Thank you. Right. <clears throat> so, um, I will take over from here. And uh, my job will be to give you um, an idea of <clears throat> the GDPR, um, an idea about the principles and the definitions uh, that are common in the GDPR and some of the regulations that are um, concerning us in the research context. Um, so the whole thing starts with the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, Article 8. Uh, and that's important because basically when the GDPR came out two years ago, um, or well, more than two years ago actually, uh, four years ago, but it came into effect two years ago, um, many people were kind of acting as if data protection was a new thing altogether, which it really isn't. Uh, data protection has been around for a long time, uh, and it has been part of the European uh, Union uh, legislation and uh, code of morals for a long time as well. Uh, in Article 8, the protection of personal data is already mentioned. Uh, everyone has the right to the protection of personal data concerning him or her. Such data must be processed fairly for specified purposes and on the basis of the consent of the person concerned, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, all of these things that are mentioned here are basically the short summary of the entire GDPR. However, the GDPR, of course, is a lot 
uh, more substantial than that and really explains not only what has to be done, but also how it has to be done in order to be conformant with law. And as Koralka already pointed out, uh, much of this is not really just about legal issues. It's very much about research ethics. So to give you an idea of the general data protection reg regulation or GDPR, a very brief mention of the difference between a reg regulation and the directive. The regulation is something that uh, becomes uh, effective European law uh, at the time when it is, uh, when it is passed. A uh, directive is something that then has to be um, implemented in the national legislation. So it's more of a set of guidelines, really. Um, it's not immediately European law. So that's the difference between a regulation and directive. Um, and there is a directive for copyright, for example, in the digital single mar market coming up, which will concern research a lot. But this one is about the regulation. Um, I'll spare you the clauses and items and stuff like that. Uh, the GDPR has been in force since the 24th of May 2016 and uh, is directly applicable European Union law as of the 25th of May 2018. So it has been around for a while and there's still a lot of insecurity about it. Um, the GDPR is a standalone law, legal text, but it also was implemented in National Data Protection Act amendments uh, in many countries or in most European uh, Union countries at this point. Uh, and we'll look at some of that uh, in the following minutes. Uh, here are links to the sources. Uh, if you want to uh, have an, a nice overview of the GDPR, you can either do it at the uh, dedicated website or, of course, you can read up on it on uh, the European um, legal portal um, where it is also published in all European Union official languages. So uh, those are official translations if you are, for example, looking uh, for the exact legal terms that are applicable to your particular country. Now, the applicability of the general data protection regulation, uh, it applies to the processing of personal data wholly or partly by automated means and to the processing other than by automated means of personal data, which form part of a filing system. Now, that's a very important thing. Very often when we talk about data, people are now thinking about digital data. And the data protection, uh, the, the GDPR, is not about uh, digital data. It is about data in general. And for example, it is about personal data, which forms part of a filing system. So basically, for example, um, if you put printed records of, for example, your lectures or something like that, participation lists, for example, or participation list of this particular workshop that we are having right now, if we print that out and put it into a filing system that is, for example, ordered by dates uh, of various events, for example, all the shock events, that would actually be processing of personal data as part of a filing system. So it doesn't matter whether it's, whether it's digital or analog. That's something to keep in mind. Uh, where is it not applicable? And that's quite important. Um, it is not applicable to natural person um, in the course of a purely personal activity, like, for example, sending a selfie to your brother or your sister or your mom. Uh, that's a purely personal activity, so you don't have to worry about uh, the GDPR. Uh, it is also not applicable for uh, authorities for the purposes of prevention of crime and so on and so on. That's the typical security exemption that we find for all of these issues. Uh, another thing that is important to, to remember is that the GDPR generally does not apply to dead people. So the GDPR only applies to natural persons and deceased persons are not considered natural by the GDPR. There is one notable exemption for that that I found and that's Denmark. Uh, in Denmark, the GDPR uh, legislation or their, their uh, take on it in the national uh, data Protection uh, Act actually uh, protects people uh, up to 10 years after uh, they, have, uh, they have died. But usually uh, the GDPR only applies to living persons. Uh, now, the GDPR applies to processing. And what is processing? Processing is any operation or set of operation 
uh, which is performed on personal data, whether or not by automated means. Um, so what you have to keep in mind in this uh, is that everything from the, from the first collection to the recording, the structuring, the retrieval, uh, the use of it, the disclosure, the transmission, everything is processing. And what is important to, to realize is that erasure, deletion of records is also processing. So you're not allowed to even delete data without consent, for example, or some other legal basis uh, for which processing is possible. What is personal data? Personal data is any kind of information relating to an identified or identifiable natural person. And here's the definition, which is also out straight out of the GDPR, about what is an identifiable natural person. And that is, I, I won't read it to you now because you can see the screen anyway. Um, and that is why uh, anonymization and pseudonymization is very important, especially in research contexts. Uh, often when you're just interested in statistical values, for example, anonymization will be just fine. Uh, pseudonymization means kind of the same thing, but uh, that you as a researcher can actually find the identifiable person behind the anonymized data. That's what makes uh, data pseudonymized. Um, however, if you are anonymizing your data, the person is no longer identifiable and hence anonymized data is not subject to the GDPR, another thing to keep in mind. Um, the GDPR uh, defines three distinct roles uh, in the data processing uh, process. Uh, and these roles you will encounter again when you're using um, our consent form wizard and play around with it in the second part of our workshop. And that's why I mentioned them here. Uh, so the three roles are controller, processor, and data subject. Uh, the controller is the natural or legal person, so it could be a research institution, university, etc., uh, which determines the purposes and the means of the processing. And that's kind of the really the responsible party. The processor might be a natural or legal person uh, which does the processing, but on behalf of the controller. So it's outsourced. Uh, the most common uh, example for that is basically, uh, for example, a company usually uh, often has someone else who does their uh, personnel management for them, for example, by outsourcing it. So the company would be the controller, uh, the employee would be the data subject, and that particular outsourced firm uh, would be the data processor. Uh, now, the data subject is the natural person whose data is processed. So in many, many contexts, obviously, we all are data subjects. And in some contexts, we may be the data controllers or the processors if we process stuff on behalf of uh, an organization. Now, there are these principles, uh, seven altogether. Um, which are the foundation for lawful data processing. So all of these pro principles have to be fulfilled in order to process data in a lawful way. Um, it's lawfulness, fairness, and transparency. There has to be a purpose limitation. There is data minimization. There is accuracy, a storage limitation, integrity and confidentiality, and accountability. Um, Lawfulness, that's probably the most important one. That's because uh, that's why it's also a little bit more uh, elaborated here. Um, lawfulness means you need to have the consent of the person, either by asking for it uh, specifically, for example, with our consent form wizard. Uh, it could also be on the basis of a contract with the data subject, which is the case, for example, for any uh, contract that you have with your uh, mobile phone provider or your internet provider and stuff like that, uh, other legal obligations, uh, safeguarding of legitimate interests, and so on and so on. Um, lawfulness also uh, requires transparency of the data collection and the data use, uh, and that's where information duties come in, and we'll talk about that in two minutes. Um, there is also a purpose limitation, 
So usually data may only be processed for a clearly defined and legitimate purpose. And there is thankfully uh, an exception to that, which I'm going to talk about uh, briefly in a, in a couple of more minutes. Uh, data minimization means, means that you should only collect the data necessary for the processing. If you're interested, if you only need, for example, the names and the email addresses, why should you ask for a birthday if you don't need it for the, for the processing of uh, for the processing purpose. Um, accuracy, every data uh, that you collect must be correct and up to date. Um, you are only allowed to store it for as long as necessary for the achievement of the purpose. Um, you have to ensure security of the data and you have to be accountable for the way you process data. So you have to give information to your subjects and training to the people who are processing the whole thing. Um, the rights of the data subject is very important because uh, these rights are um, concerning us with every data processing that we do. Um, it's uh, information and that's the most important thing. You have to inform your subjects about how you're going to use their data, for what purpose and so on and so on. Um, we have it here in more detail. Um, and it has to be quite precise about the processing purposes, the categories that you want to process, uh, the recipients with which you're going to share the whole thing, if you're going to share the data, the duration for which personal data has to be stored, the existence of a right to rectify or erase personal data, and the existence of a right to appeal. All of these things have to go into um, such information that you give to your uh, data subjects. Um, for example, also into a consent form wizard when you're asking for consent. Um, the other, um, the other uh, points here, access, rectification, and so on, um, we, don't go, we won't go into uh, much detail here, um, but it's important to keep it in mind because, as I said before, most of us are data subject all of the time. Uh, and uh, it's also good to remind that these are our own rights, actually, in many contexts. Um, however, many of these rights, especially, for example, the right to erase your personal data at any time and to withdraw consent would be a big problem for research, obviously, because uh, if half of our subjects withdraw their consent after they have given it halfway as we are finishing our studies, um, it would be a problem because our research base uh, would certainly not apply anymore. Uh, so the, um, the result of our study or of our research would be in danger. And that's why there are certain exceptions to the GDPR. And there are two of them that we are going to mention. Uh, one of them is Article 85, uh, because sometimes there are people uh, who do journalism uh, in these workshops. Uh, or academic, artistic, and literary expression. So there can be certain uh, exceptions to the GDPR and the rights that are defined in the GDPR, uh, as long uh, as they are kind of in conflict with freedom of expression and information. Uh, but still keep in mind that you have to be very careful about that, because usually in the European legislation, the rights of the individual are uh, considered stronger than the rights of the public in most contexts. Uh, so uh, that's kind of an, uh, an article to be very wary about. However, there is thankfully for research and similar purposes, uh, Article 89, which is our friend. Uh, Article 89 um, defines an exception for archiving purposes in the public interest scientific or historical research purposes or statistical purposes. Uh, now, being a trained historian myself, I kind of wonder why historical research is not part of scientific research to begin, to begin with, but that's just an, uh, an, an aside remark. Um, but basically what Article 89 says is union or member state law may provide for derogations from rights of access, rectification, restriction, uh, or of the processing, um, uh, sorry, uh, or the rights of the, um, of the rights of, uh, no, or the rights to object, sorry, because I can't see the screen because it's made, made up by the, 
uh, it's it's taken up by the the preview of the Zoom. Uh, so yeah, union or member state law may provide for derogation from rights of access, rectification, restriction of processing, or the right to object, in so far as such rights are likely to render impossible or seriously impair the achievement of the specific purposes providing that appropriate safeguards are applied. What does that mean in practice? Um, we can, in research contexts, um, actually obtain broad consent. So if we obtain consent, we don't have to do it for one specific purpose, like one specific study, but can actually obtain consent for more research areas or for a larger uh, research area. Um, we have a purpose extension. So research is always considered a compatible purpose by the GDPR. So if we have lawfully gathered data through some other means, and the important, important, important thing is that it has to be gathered lawfully, obviously. Uh, we can actually use that data for research because research is always a compatible purpose. Uh, there is also a storage extension, so there is no limitation for the duration. Uh, because the limitation for duration is usually uh, you can store something until your purpose is fulfilled. And the reasoning behind that is that your research purpose, of course, um, is never really fulfilled because your research can be reused and so on and so on. And there is a, an erasure limitation, which is very important um, because uh, this erasure or this right to, to delete your data is not applicable if the exercise of this right is rendering impossible or impairing the research that you have contributed to. However, keep in mind that you have to keep appropriate safeguards if you want to benefit from these exceptions. So you actually have to take care of, for example, pseudonymization. You have to be very transparent about what you do with the data, what data you collect, etc. Um, and maybe you should require, uh, you should think about opt-out policies and so on, because that your data subject is like can legally not force you to delete their data is one thing. But maybe we should consider that if people want to withdraw their data. Uh, that we originally collected, we should actually give them the opportunity to do that and not use their data if they're actually not okay with it anymore. Uh, similar things are codes of conduct, ethics commissions, and so on. Uh, so keep in mind that you have to basically uh, take some responsibility for these things if you want to profit from the exception in Article 89. And that concludes the very quick crash course through the GDPR. Uh, and I'll hand over to Vanessa now to show you one of the tools uh, that we have created for that purpose. Hi, sorry, I lost my Zoom. Uh, here you are. Um, Thank you uh, to, uh, to all of you for being here. Thank you, uh, Laure and uh, Tanya and the Shock community for having us. Um, hi from my side. I always have to start with a big welcome if I didn't have the, the screen yet. So um, hi, here I am. Um, but now that I do have the screen, I will share it with you right away. And I will show you the very pretty tool that um, Walter already mentioned to you, the consent form wizard. So um, you will have a, a chance to play around with this tool yourself uh, in a few minutes when we split up into the breakout rooms. Um, for now, let me give you a brief introduction to um, to the, the purpose and use of this tool. So you've heard quite a lot about the GDPR and what it requires us to do. Um, and you've also heard um, how, uh, how, how lawfulness is, is one, of the, um, one of the core um, requirements that the, the GDPR uh, formulates. Um, I think that um, a lot of the work that we do, even the work that we do involving personal data in the field of research, more specifically in the field of humanities research, um, social sciences might be a little different and um, it's definitely a different case for, um, for the hard sciences, especially medicine. So once, uh, once we deal with, with medical data, um, things get really, really um, 
uh, serious. So we, we have to be extremely careful about what we do. And I think the same is true for the data that we gather in the field of social sciences or can be true for the data that we gather in this area. However, for like traditional humanities research, I think a lot of the research that is being done could be done without, you know, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's when it comes to data protection, because we don't really do anything um, with, with the most detailed personal data. So um, I think that's, um, that's a good like starting point for, for us because um, we, what we can do is we can say, okay, uh, in the humanities, in the tr classical humanities, um, we're not hurting anyone if we make any mistakes, but that also makes it a good uh, playing field to try out how to do it right and we don't have to we don't have to panic if we don't get it completely right the very first time. Um, so that's sort of a that's a, like the the prequel to my introduction to the consent form wizard. So um, when we try to figure out how to do it right, doing data protection right in in the humanities, because this is um, the the field that um, we we originally come from. Um, but the, the social sciences, of course, also uh, come in and also play their role. But, but originally, we or I come from the humanities. So here is, here is where uh, the idea for this, for this tool emerged. Um, we realized that there are quite a number of purposes that we, um, that we have uh, time and again uh, for which we have to process personal data. Uh, classical cases of, of, of data processing um, that we um, run into uh, very frequently and that we never properly solved because we never really felt that it really, really mattered. But then the GDPR came and everyone suddenly was very aware of data privacy issues. And so, um, so were we. And, um, and so we decided that finally we will have to try and do it right. So, um, this is where, where it all started. Um, we came up with this tool um, to uh, have a, a possibility to gather consent when we have to do it. So um, the GDPR does allow us to process data um, if we have other legitimate interests or if we, do, if we have legitimate interests to do the processing of the data. Um, without actually um, requiring us to collect the consent of the people whose data we're processing. But uh, in order to be, um, to be very um, um, on the safe side, and especially if we are processing data in the context of research, we really have to make sure um, that we do it right, because um, if we don't, then, then at some point the data will be taken away from us or could legally be taken away from us or would uh, not have been collected lawfully in the first place. And that, that might, um, of course, create problems for the research that is supposed to emerge on the basis of the data that was collected. So um, the tool that we built uh, allows us to create a consent form template. So it doesn't actually allow us to collect consent from our research subjects. So it's not a tool that you can um, use for your own consent management, but it's a tool that allows you to, um, to create a consent form without having to uh, work through the entire GDPR yourself. So if you are a researcher, um, either at a research institution or also an independent researcher, and you are trying to do one of the typical things that researchers do, and you want to uh, collect your data subject's consent uh, for your doing so, then this is the tool for you. Um, as it is a, a tool that is openly and freely available on the internet, and as it is a tool that doesn't actually, um, so you have to put in a lot of data, also personal data, um, which uh, you have to first of all consent to, and then second of all, which we are not storing because we we do not want to um, have your data um, and and be responsible for um, for handling your personal data. So 
as uh, as this this is the case, um, we can of course not guarantee uh, that the consent forms that the tool will spit out in the end are actually um, legally valid for the purpose of what you're doing because we don't have any way of controlling if the data that you inputted are actually correct and if you are um, telling us the truth. So um, I have to sort of make this disclaimer in the beginning because you have to be very aware that it's a tool that is supposed to help you and what we can say is that if you answer all the questions truthfully and if you input all the correct data, then the consent form that you will uh, end up with will help you collect legal consent lawfully and um, it will allow you to do so um, in the entire European Union. Um, but uh, of course, uh, there are limits to what a, what a tool like this can, can um, realistically do for you. Um, so uh, this is uh, also um, <laughs> sort of a, a prequel to the big disclaimer I am making now. Um, we are not lawyers. Um, there was a lawyer involved in building this tool, but this tool is not a lawyer and the people responsible for the tool are not lawyers. So um, it can help you to do things, but if you have the slightest question or the slightest doubt about the legality of what you're planning to do with the personal data of people, um, th this, is, this is not where to go. So uh, this is not formal legal advice. This tool will not replace consulting a lawyer in cases where uh, a lawyer has to be consulted. So big disclaimer. Um, what you can see here, I think I have to make one note. Um, on the on the date of publication and on the on the last update of the tool so we launched the tool uh, in September we were actually finished with uh, working on it uh, well before that and uh, that uh, something happened uh, between our finishing on uh, <laughs> finishing the the work on the content of the wizard or the functionalities and the finalization of the implementation. There was, um, uh, there was a ruling by the uh, European uh, courts about uh, the data privacy um, shield, uh, the, what's, what's, Walter help me, what's the name of the framework? The- Privacy shield, yeah. Yeah, the privacy shield uh, framework. So the, the which is the, the um, a contract between the European Union and the USA about the exchange of personal data. So um, this contract was actually killed by European courts um, between our finishing working on the tool and our final launch. So uh, we don't currently have a solution for how to legally share data with partners in the US because there currently is no legal solution for doing that as um, the European Union has not come up with a fix for, for this uh, broken contract. So um, sorry, not our fault. But this is also uh, one of the disclaimers that I have to um, make. And um, before uh, we uh, break out into the breakout rooms, uh, let me um, introduce you to the to the three most uh, most frequent scenarios that we identified and let me uh, say a few words on them um, let me start with the let's say less exciting more everyday uh, scenarios um, that we identified that researchers frequently have to deal with one is to communicate um, through mailing lists it's uh, quite a common scenario or through other communication channels uh, for which you would collect um, a list of, of contact addresses to keep people in touch, to keep in touch with people, to keep people informed. Um, that is something that we quite frequently do, um, if we like it or not, or that we quite frequently have to do. Um, another uh, thing that we quite frequently um, do and have to do, not so much at the moment, but hopefully sometime soon again, is uh, organizing academic events. Currently, they are all and exclusively on the internet. 
um, which doesn't actually mean that we are not uh, collecting and processing data when we host these events. On the contrary, we are actually probably collecting even more uh, and processing even more personal data um, or um, sometimes it's not even us as the organizers, um, but it's um, the software companies that provide the tools and services that we use for these events, but that's um, maybe a little out of scope for, uh, for our today, for our event today. So um, we built this scenario um, with a, an actual real life event in mind. Um, so, uh, and we also, we also built uh, this, this scenario um, with, uh, with conference management software in mind. So what we, um, what we really tried to cover in this third scenario um, where we help you um, to um, create a consent form for participants, uh, for, for participants to consent to the processing of their data when they attend your academic events. Um, we basically had conf tool in mind, which is something that you uh, most probably will have run into if you have ever attended any DH related conference pretty much anywhere. Um, and uh, so, so this, is, um, this is the third scenario. And um, I'm, I'm elaborating very much on this, on this uh, uh, liveness in mind. Um, because uh, it brings with it uh, some very interesting special issues that might not come to mind immediately or that, um, that create interesting problems. For example, if you collect information about dietary requirements from people, you are actually um, collecting uh, very uh, sensitive data because dietary requirements might um, imply medical information about people or might imply information about their religious beliefs. So that is actually something that is, that is um, highly problematic and that has to be handled um, in, in a specific, uh, specific way, has to protect, be protected more carefully um, than normal personal data like a name and an address. So, um, Quite, quite interesting uh, issues come up when you really try to think these scenarios through. Um, the most um, interesting, I don't know, the most um, exciting maybe a scenario that, that of course we tried to deal with and that we are trying to cover with the, with the tool is uh, the collection of data um, for uh, research purposes. Um, and the issue with this is that it's, of course, uh, the scenario that is most interesting for us in our, um, because researchers um, see it as their core function to do research and not to, not to organize events. Um, but it also comes with, with its uh, specific problems that are not so easy to solve in a tool that is supposed to work um, everywhere or at least throughout the entire European Union. So um, as Walter explained, we can go pretty far. The GDPR um, does have research exceptions and allows us to, um, to uh, really uh, to provide a, a comprehensive way of, of legally handling people's data for research purposes. But uh, there are limits to what we can um, solve in a unified European level. Um, and what I mean is um, the storage on, and the archiving of actual research data. So um, you will see that you will run into certain dead ends if you try to um, tell the wizard that you would like to uh, store da data indefinitely. And the reason for that is that the um, rules for, uh, for, ar for archiving uh, information uh, vary from European country to European country or from country to country worldwide. Um, so it's, not, it's just not legally possible to, um, to solve the question of data archiving in a tool that is supposed to um, provide reliable answers throughout the entire European Union. Um, and uh, I'm sure we will run into, uh, into um, discussing this, this uh, topic uh, in the breakout rooms. Where we are supposed to be heading right now, because I see that I'm already five minutes over my time, um, 
I think we can continue discussion in the breakout rooms or if you have any uh, immediate questions, of course, uh, you can ask them now. So thank you, uh, Koralka. Thank you, Walter. And thank you, Vanessa. Uh, in the meantime, I see that the uh, conversation is also going on via the chat. So it's great. Thank you for also answering some of the question, uh, Walter. So we will indeed um, now split into the breakout rooms. So in the, during this presentation, uh, Tanya and uh, Christina were organizing the breakout room. So it should be ready now, or at least I had a message in the chat uh, that said me that uh, everybody was uh, assigned to one breakout room. So you can, you, you will be split into, so you have nothing to do. It will be an automatic process uh, that can take uh, one minute or so. Um, if you, you have a button, you can still uh, like ask for help from the host. Uh, so if you need something, you can, you can still use this button on your Zoom interface. And uh, if you want to go back to the main room at some point, uh, you can also quick, um, click on leave. So not leave the full meeting, but just leave the breakout session and it will bring you back to the main room. So this, this room where we are now. Um, but at the end of the breakout session, it's planned that uh, it's also an automatic process that bring you back to the main room. So if you do nothing, you will be conducted in the room and you, you will also uh, be bring back in, in, the, in the room at the end. So if everything is ready, Tanya, maybe you can launch the process. Done. <laughs> Thank you. I see some of you haven't been able to join. Uh, so Heike, uh, I see that you haven't joined. You have, should supp you're supposed to accept the invitation. So there must be a button uh, that you can click to join. Uh, same as, uh, oh, uh, I'm going to say the name that I have in the list instead of the one, uh, uh, Svetlana Christova.
I didn't receive any uh, notification to join. Yeah, I sent you a, a, a chat. Did you want to join one uh, of the groups? Uh, yes, you can put me in uh, uh, like one there is uh, less people maybe than others. Okay, then I will put you in the first one and I'll see you in about 20 minutes. 25. Okay, and for the two others that remain here in the main room, yeah, uh, yeah, I text in contact with them. Yeah, great. Thank okay. you. <laughs> no problem. Bye. So we will wait for the last uh, breakout rooms uh, participant to join. Maybe we lost some in the in the middle. <laughs> Welcome back. So yes, I think we were 45 or so before the breakout room session. So let's see how many we lose in between. But I think you are more or less all there. So thank you for coming back. Um, I hope everything uh, went well. We now have 10 minutes to summarize uh, the different sessions. So maybe Vanessa, Koralka, Walter, you want to, to share uh, with us the, the highlights of, of your sessions? I don't know who wants to start. I'll be happy to start. Um, I can report that we ran into a very interesting bug that uh, I haven't seen so far, <laughs> where uh, uh, we cannot uh, answer uh, or we cannot indicate any information about the research project that the data is being collected for, but then also can't finish because we didn't fill in the field that was never provided. Um, so, yeah, um, that is an, a to do that I'm taking with me. Um, aside from that, uh, we, uh, I think uh, one of the, the um, most important takeaway messages um, that sort of uh, should also be my, my inspirational uh, um, message now to all of you uh, is that while the wizard uh, hopefully helps you to um, obtain a really legally valid consent form and, and helps you to do what is legally necessary, what it cannot do for you is um, to, to um, sort of provide you with a template for ethical conduct. So um, you can obtain a consent form that is a very dry and boring and not very easily understandable legal text that you will have your research subject sign. But then um, as a, your, your big responsibility as the person using the consent forms that you are provided with um, by this tool, um, the big responsibility that you have is to communicate to your research subjects what that actually means that you're asking of them. So um, we talked about questions of, of uh, collecting consent from mentally impaired people, which would be a difficult issue altogether collecting uh, consent from parents of kids whose data are being processed. So um, that are, of course, special areas, but also when handling personal data of grown-up adults who are not um, dealing like Walter Koralka and I with uh, questions of the, of the nature of the GDPR every day. Um, they don't need to be uneducated. They don't even need to be uh, not researchers. Even researchers can be challenged with uh, handling legal information, handling legally valid texts. So our big responsibility, and that is also one of the um, aims of the wizard, is to understand data privacy as researchers and to um, to really make sure that the people whose data we are handling um, 
also understand what it is that we're doing with them. So, um, and that is um, our personal task, I would say, in, in dealing with our, um, with our subjects. So here's my, my inspiration to all of you. I should have gone third, so that is a good going away message, but sorry, I'm shutting up. Walter, Koralka. Going first? Okay, I'm next. Okay, I mean, um, I can share again my screen maybe, because uh, we have a document here. There are some participants, or I think maybe Laura put here some notes, <laughs> the comments, uh, things we were discussing. Um, uh, for example, uh, uh, there was a question of um, whether we can add a sup supervisor field, you know, uh, clarification of the roles, you know, uh, but I think it's actually this uh, contact person that we have. I don't know, uh, Vanessa would know more because she was uh, really developing this tool. I was just testing it and uh, uh, suggesting some uh, issues, but um, because we had this, um, we, I think there is in the research a scenario there uh, the leader of the project uh, as a contact person I think and so on but uh, here uh, on the scenarios for organizing uh, organization of event or a communication mailing list um, I think that uh, next to this institution name that contact person is maybe that role I don't know whether we should uh, change uh, this um, uh, contact a person with some other you know uh, name like a supervisor or to clarify it more i don't i'm not sure uh, also there was a um, note about the expert formats uh, but we were also discussing this option because this rough text format is not so well not so nice but uh, we are editing it uh, in our own institutional templates uh, for further uh, needs. But uh, maybe, uh, I mean, it's sure possible for us to provide you also with the Word template, uh, uh, role, uh, this uh, text in a Word uh, document. Uh, I'm just not sure because of the rights for using the Word, but yes, we can use it. Right, Vanessa? I know that we were discussing this, but okay, uh, we'll think about this. And um, uh, Catherine uh, had uh, um, some pro problems, uh, questions about the finalization of this uh, uh, consent uh, because she was asking uh, how can she collect the signatures from the uh, people, you know, how, uh, what is the proof that they read uh, the contest and uh, that it will work in her, uh, uh, with her needs for organizing uh, events, you know. Um, how she gets, well, mainly I think, Catherine, right? Uh, how do you uh, can collect the signature uh, or whether you really need the signature or it's enough to, um, to let people know that... Right. I was wondering exactly that. When do I need a signature and when is it enough to say, by continuing, you agree? with the, what is written here, click here. I can answer that directly if you like. Yes, please. <laughs> um, basically, the, the signature is not the important thing, uh, but it has to be some kind of action on behalf of your data subject. So a concludent uh, agreement at this point is no longer valid in most circumstances. Uh, so it always takes some kind of action uh, and that's what you see all the time now with, uh, yeah, like whenever you enter a website, uh, you can't just click OK, but usually you have to tick a checkbox before that. So it requires something like that, uh, but that's sufficient. You don't really need like the actual electronic signature or real signature or something like that. It has to be arguably some kind of, um, yeah, a, a real input by the, by the data subject. Uh, when they are agreeing. Yeah, but I think it is still, unfortunately, in my experience, you know, click, uh, check this box to indicate you agree with our privacy statement available mm. here. Now I click to look at the privacy statement and it's 10 pages of <laughs> yeah, unintelligible 
<laughs> I mean, is that what our aim is? Um, it's well. The the problem is that uh, we we can't do more than uh, do it by the book. If people choose not to exercise their right to read what we are giving them, uh, you know, there is nothing really we can do about it. So there's there's no no way around this. I'm afraid. So all we can do is point to the to the legal obligations and fulfill them. And if people choose to click or click on something before they actually read the the text in the background, there isn't really much we can do about it. I'm afraid. I had a very positive experience at uh, University College Dublin, uh, where I was organizing some focus groups and the the. GDPR officer there insisted that all legal text also had a plain language mm -hmm. uh, summary mm -hmm. and both of these were provided to yeah. the participants. I found this really valuable. That's a, that's a very good idea and I think we are doing a little bit of that with the consent form wizard because we are explaining some of the some of the legal terms and stuff like that uh, but of course I mean there, there can always be more like a glossary or something like that you know um, it would, um, if I if I may jump in here I, I think we are precisely what you're saying Walter we are explaining a lot of the of the legal language in the GDPR but we're not explaining it to the consentees yeah. um, but to the consent collectors yeah. So uh, what we're trying to do is to to educate those who are collecting the consent so that they can then um, pass on the information to their uh, data subjects. I do, the the question of, of plain or, or, or human readable legal text is uh, something that we also discussed in, in our session. Um, and I think uh, this is a, a general issue that um, that we need to deal with on a different level than this specific tool. Also, um, doing this translation work from legal text to um, understandable text um, is something that is um, that is quite a, 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 a delicate subject. So that is something that you can't just do is but you have to you, you have to take a lot of things into consideration so that it still counts so that it's still valuable uh, uh, valid um, so uh, that's not something you can do passing by uh, which is also why uh, it wasn't in the scope of the project up to here to to do this uh, thanks a lot for uh, for this uh, exchange. Um, as I see that we already have uh, eight minutes more than the actual sh uh, schedule, maybe Walter, you want to highlight uh, some of the things that were going on in your sessions? Um, yeah, we had uh, pretty much the, the same thing uh, with the uh, with the template, basically that the consent form wizard. Uh, you have to be aware that it gives you a template that you can then adjust uh, rather than you know, a neat form that you can just use as it is. Um, because we realized early on when we were uh, like considering various output formats uh, that some people may use it in printing, some people may use it as a web form. Um, and many people will use it in contexts where, for example, a funding agency, agency wants their logo added or something like that. So that's why we kept it raw. Uh, having said that, I think that doing a word form is probably possible <laughs> um, and it shouldn't be it's it's not a problem legally either because we you know that's that's something we can do um, the other thing that we we ran into was that apparently uh, th there might be might be a, a code problem but I'll have to check that afterwards um, that an added data category didn't show up in the final form uh, template but we'll I'll, I'll check <laughs> uh, maybe it got lost on the way um, yeah, so I think that was pretty much it. Otherwise, uh, there were a lot of, of uh, encouraging uh, remarks about the usefulness of the tool and uh, the, the, the possibilities with it. So thank you for that. Um, Vanessa already did the inspirational part like 10 minutes ago, which is kind of 
you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, um, I, I think in 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 short, uh, I'm, we are all glad if you use the tool. Uh, the question also came up, please, by all means, uh, share it with your colleagues, uh, tweet about it, uh, send it to mailing lists, do whatever, spread the word. Uh, we are delighted if it finds use. Uh, we are also delighted if we get feedback, if you, if you or your colleagues find anything that uh, still requires some clarification. Uh, we are also happy to just get an email saying, hey, You've done great. Um, so uh, that's a nice thing as well. Um, so by all means, please use it uh, and also um, take it as a starting point. I think we are all, um, as we pointed out on, on, on several uh, at several points during the um, ah yeah uh, during the presentation. Um, the consent form wizard is a tool that helps you with, with legal practices, but it's also uh, just one stepping stone uh, towards uh, ethical research and conducting research in an ethical way. Uh, and uh, that's what we all strive for, I guess. Um, Vanessa, do you want to take over briefly or? I think I did. I, I don't have any more inspiration in me. It just bubbled out of me right away. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for uh, attending this workshop this morning. Thank you very much for our three speakers for presenting. I think it's very interesting to see this GDPR put into practice and, uh, and how we can actually help uh, with, uh, with such a, a tool that the, than the consent form wizard. So it was really a, a productive session, in my opinion, also with a nice atmosphere. So thank you uh, to all of you for attending. And uh, we do hope to be able to organize a face-to-face -face event in uh, 2021 uh, with the same team. So stay tuned uh, via the shop website, the LDA blog, the DIA channels, uh, all the, the channels that uh, Vanessa just uh, shared on, on the screen a few minutes ago. And uh, you will receive uh, after the, um, uh, the, the session, um, uh, a poll, I see a survey, a uh, feedback form to, to, fill in, to fill out. So please contribute also to help us to improve uh, our next uh, session. And um, I wish you all a very nice day. Thank you very much. <laughs>